Yeah. Good, okay. So utilitarianism, or oh, can you read the stuff on the board from there? Can you see on yeah. the screen? Good, okay. Three. Utilitarianism is one of our ethical theories. There are three ethical theories that we need to know this year. Natural law we've looked at, utilitarianism we're doing now, and one we haven't done yet but that we will do, which is Kantian ethics. Okay? So this is the second sort of major piece of content, so something we really, really need to know. In the exam, you could get a question, explain utilitarianism. You could also get an explain how utilitarianism could be applied to one of the topics kind of question, such as how would utilitarianism be applied to the issues surrounding euthanasia or something like that. So this is a key exam topic. You can't afford to go into the exam and not know this. Okay? This ethical theory, um, this ethical theory, it starts with a principle, a main idea. So this is the principle of utility. So write this down. And this bit I hope you do know. So this, um, this principle is like the guiding idea behind utilitarianism. So it's called the principle of utility, and it says that you should always try to achieve the greatest good for the greatest number. The greatest good for the greatest number. Because it's something you're trying to achieve, this is an outcome, so it is a teleological ethical theory. It's teleological because it's about outcomes or consequences. So in your introduction to an essay, you'd want to explain that it's a teleological ethical theory. It's looking at the consequences, sometimes even called consequentialism, because it's looking at the, con the, um, the consequences of your actions. And you should try to achieve the greatest good for the greatest number. So we've looked at some examples of this. Remember when we looked at that person, the person who was stuck in the cave, and they had to decide what to do, and you know, if they were going to kill the person to get out. The greatest good for the greatest number would be, well, overall... What actions would bring about the most amount of good? Okay, the greatest good for the most number of people, the greatest number. Okay, so that principle is the key, key, key idea. Does that make sense? Greatest good for the greatest number. So, there are different types of utilitarianism. How are they divided? Well, they're divided on what this word good means. That word good, the way that's def defined, gives you the, the different meanings. So the first one, the first one is Jeremy Bentham. And Jeremy Bentham said that good is pleasure. So he said we should try to bring about the greatest amount of pleasure for the greatest number of people. So seeking pleasure and avoiding pain is our motive. So we are motivated. By something that he called hedonism which is seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. Okay, so if you're hedonistic, you seek pleasure and you avoid pain. And Bentham said that all humans, that's what we are motivated by. We do things that are pleasurable, we avoid things that are unpleasurable. And therefore, when we're making ethical decisions, we should try to bring about the outcome that has the most pleasure for the most people, or avoids the most pain for the most people. Okay, that was Bentham's main idea, that we should try to... We, we, the good equals pleasure, and we're motivated by hedonism, which is seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. Right, so, uh, how do you work that out? Well, for Bentham, the way you work that out is you use the calculus, which, given that it's about hedonism, is called the hedonic calculus. Okay? And this is your, like, your balancing scales to work out what brings about the most pleasure or the most pain. We had an acronym to try to work this out, which is not ideal. Do you remember these, this acronym? So we had purity, uh, remoteness, intensity, these words, okay? Purity, how pure. So is it 100% pleasurable, or is there quite a lot of pain mixed in, or is it like where it's 100% pain with no pleasure mi mixed in? You know, what's the purity of that pleasure or pain? The remoteness, how near or far away is that pleasure or that pain? The intensity, how strong is that pleasure or that pain? 
the certainty, how definite is that pleasure or that pain, the extent, that's your number, that's how many people are involved, so that's going back to the greatest number bit, how many people are involved, the extent of people, duration, obviously how long it's going to last, the pleasure or the pain, and finally the fantasy, which is this sort of spreadability, how much impact does it have to affect somebody else? So, for example, if you choose to, I don't know, end your life for euthanasia, that's going to have an impact on other people besides you. If you decide to uh, give money to charity, that's going to have an impact on other people besides you. So that's the last one, okay? So price F is the best we've got for an acronym for remembering that. I realise it's not perfect, but that's the idea. So, how does this work? What you have to do for all situations, you use this calculus, and you can think of it as having pleasure on one side and having pain on the other side, and you can maybe have a scale where it's like... And you have to decide, okay, I'm about to do something. Where would it go on this scale for purity? And you might say, well, this is... The thing I'm about to do is I'm about to have an abortion or something like that. And you might say, right, well, that's on the pain scale. The purity of the pain is that's a three or whatever you decide it is. The intensity of that pain, you might say, well, that's actually not too bad. It's a one or something like that. The certainty of that pain, you might say it's a five or whatever. And you add that all up and you decide. Or you might say it's over here or whatever. You know, the certain to feel happy about it, whatever you think. But you do your calculation. You go through your calculus. And at the end you should know what to do, how to act. Okay, so that's, that's how the hedonic calculus works. So if I said to you, somebody's thinking about having an abortion, what should they do? You'd have to go through, use the calculus, work out the different bits, and work out how they would act. That's the idea. Okay? Because of that, because it's all about the numbers, because it's all about those numbers, um, we call it a... It's, it's a quantity rather than a quality. So it's a quantitative way of looking at it. Because you look at the numbers of things on each side. So you're like doing a balancing act of numbers rather than doing anything else. So we say that's a quantitative approach. Okay? It's a quantitative approach. Likewise, this is about, or not likewise, but additionally, this is also an individual, individual approach. You act as an individual. Okay? rather than as a community, you make a decision about how you should act as an individual to bring about the principle of utility. Finally, at the moment, this is act utilitarianism. And act utilitarianism means um, that you should, in each situation, act in the way that brings about the most pleasure and avoids the most pain, using the hedonic calculus in that decision. In that instant, you should use your rationality to work out what to do, how to act in that situation. Okay? Does that vaguely make sense? So, if we were to summarise that, I would suggest that you could understand all of, or you could summarise that if you had like a revision note in Bentham, your Bentham sort of side of the argument could be that he would say it's pleasure, that it's hedonism, that it's the hedonic calculus, that it's individual, and that it's act and quantity. Okay, that's your like your main ideas and your optics for Bentham. So, and we come. If you've got some questions, come back to it in a second. That's Bentham. That's one side of the argument. Now, one of his supporters and one of his followers was someone called John Stuart Mill. And John Stuart Mill was also a utilitarian. He also supported this idea of the greatest good for the greatest number. But he slightly adapted Bentham's approach. He felt it could be improved. So Mill is an alternative position. Mill said that goodness is not pleasure. Pleasure doesn't work for goodness because we can find basic things, simple things, pleasurable, and that is not as important as some more complicated things. He said you couldn't compare the pleasure of a newborn baby compared to the pleasure of eating a Mars bar. Those two things could not be weighed up. There wasn't a number you could attach to them. Okay, a Mars bar is obviously better. Um, you, couldn't, you, couldn't, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't add those up. So Mill said we shouldn't have the word pleasure. We should instead have the word happiness. Okay, and the word happiness is spelled with an I. It's not spelled with a Y. This is a 
little tip there to irritate his hand as he's trying to work on. So he says, instead of saying, what's the most pleasurable thing you can bring about, he would say, how can you bring about the most happiness? He thought that happiness was more important than pleasure. Okay? He said that pleasures could be divided into higher and lower groups. So you get the higher and the lower pleasures. And the higher ones are the ones that bring true happiness. The lower ones are not as important. Okay? The higher ones are intellectual. The lower ones are bodily. They're of the body. So, for example, this one might be sex and this one might be love. Okay? As a, just as, a, as an example. And uh, Mill argued that it was better to have any amount of the higher pleasure would be more important than any amount of the lower pleasure. So even if you had just a tiny bit, a little bit of the higher pleasure, that wiped out a huge amount of the lower pleasure. So you couldn't just add up the quantity, like Bentham did. Instead, you had to have quality. It was about how good or bad those pleasures were, whether they were higher or lower, that was important, not just whether how many they were. You couldn't just add them up. So the hedonic calculus was gone. Okay, you had to look at the higher pleasures, and you had to seek the higher pleasures. So if you're about to have an abortion, you have to think, is this a higher pleasure? Is this an intellectual pleasure that I'm now about to undertake or not? And it might be, but that's what you'd have to consider. Okay? Um, Bentham was mostly concerned about how individuals would act, but Mill cared about how the society... I mean, Bentham did care about society as well, but it was about how individuals would act in society. Mill thought that we should all f focused on what was going to bring about the greatest good for the greatest number for our society. And so his focus was more on society than on the individual. And as a result, he said that we should follow rules. His, his is a type of rule utilitarianism. He said that we should create rules based on general common sense principles that in the past have shown us what the greatest good for the greatest number is. And we should just carry on following those rules. So, for example, you might have a rule, do not kill, because in the past you've seen that do not kill brings about more happiness than to have a rule that says do kill. And you'd follow that rule whenever you think it would work and put it into place. And if you felt it wasn't going to work in a situation, you could abandon it and become an act utilitarian. But most of the time you can follow rules. So this rule utilitarian is... Follow rules that in the past have successfully achieved, and I'm going to put the P as U, which means the principle of utility. Does that all make sense? So that's it. So that, that's, that's all we need to know at this stage about um, utilitarianism and Bentham Mill. So you've got Bentham saying that. We should interpret the principle of utility as pleasure, that we should look at seeking pleasure and avoiding pain, i.e. hedonism, that we should have a hedonic calculus to work it out, and that's that purity, remoteness, etc., 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 that we should look at individuals and how they should act, and we should make decisions as we go along, we should act in a certain way, that we should look at the number, the quantity on each side and balance it like scales. That was Bentham's idea. Mill came along and changed quite a lot of those. He said, not pleasure, it's happiness. It's not hard on the calculus, it's higher and lower pleasures. And we should seek the higher pleasures, the intellectual pleasures, over the bodily pleasures. He also said that we should therefore look at the quality of those pleasures, how good or bad they are, not just the quantity, how much they are. And he says, therefore, we encourage to have a good society and act as a society. One way to do that is to have rule utilitarianism. This is the idea that rather than just making acts, acting according to the principle of utility, you would put general principles, rules down, before you got into any situation that you think would work, and you follow them where you think they would work. So you might have a rule like do not steal, which in the past or generally you think leads to the greatest good for the greatest number. Okay? There is another version of utilitarianism, it's one that Jess said about as, uh, singers' uh, preference utilitarianism, but we, haven't, we won't come to that one just yet. Okay? But that, they, they are two so far. So, any questions about any of that?